continuing 2019 educational webinar series. I am Katherine Short, Partnership Marketing Manager for FIRST Healthcare Compliance. At FIRST Healthcare Compliance, we help you with a comprehensive compliance management solution tailored to your business, a hospital, hospital network, healthcare practice of any size, billing company, or skilled nursing facility. As part of our complimentary educational webinar series, we bring you experts from around the country to discuss relevant topics in the healthcare industry. We are so pleased to have Stan Spittek, President of Fire and Life Safety Incorporated with us today. Mr. Spittek is a nationally known fire and life safety disaster preparedness consultant with more than 30 years of experience as an emergency responder, public official, life code enforcement officer, and private consultant serving clients in all occupancy types with special focus on multi-unit residential housing properties, healthcare, and educational institutions. Mr. Spittek has an extensive experience in the strategic planning and delivery of a wide variety of emergency services to a metropolitan community, as well as the development and implementation of proactive programs designed to reduce the risk of fire and other adverse events. As a private consultant, Mr. Spittek provides the unique perspective of a seasoned fire marshal to assist clients with life safety code compliance and the development of disaster planning, emergency management programs to help an occupancy plan, pre prepare, mitigate, respond, and recover from a disaster or other critical incident. A copy of the slides is available for download on the control panel. Feel free to submit questions into the question box of your control panel during the presentation. We will address questions at the conclusion of the presentation. Your PACOM and PMI CEU certificates will be emailed to you following the broadcast. Your PACOM certificate will come directly from PACOM and your PMI certificate will come from our email. There is no need to request either one. Additional CEU opportunities will be available to BC Advantage members following the live broadcast. See their website for details. A download of the handout is available with a button on the bottom right hand side of your screen. So Stan, a warm welcome. Well, Catherine, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me once again. And I sure do appreciate the opportunity to share my perspective on fire and life safety compliance and healthcare facilities. And, um, you know, meet with your audience today so that we can um, talk about some of the things that are uh, important in ensuring a safe and prepared environment of care in any kind of healthcare facility. Um, in my background, I, thanks for that uh, detailed overview, but one of the things that I want to tell the folks on the, on the call today is I work in hospitals, primarily in skilled nursing facilities where the code requirements in regulated healthcare facilities uh, in chapters 18 and 19 of the Life Safety Code are pretty similar. You know, we might have some folks in medical offices, health centers, and other um, types of facilities like inpatient hospice and so forth. But in general, we're, we're talking about regulated healthcare facilities that are generally governed by CMS regulations in chapters 18 and 19 of the Life Safety Code. I just wanna start out by just trying to provide some clarity to everyone on the call today. You know, one of the things that I do since I retired from the fire service about 16 years ago and decided that I wanted to be effective with providers like you by helping you on the inside out, not so much as that first responder anymore, but more on the consulting side, making sure that your facilities are compliant, making sure that your properties are prepared. You know, when we did the emergency preparedness presentation a while back, one of the points that I always try to make in my presentations is that it can't be compliance just for compliance sake. Certainly, you've got to comply with regulations, codes, and standards. You've got multiple authorities having jurisdiction, which we'll talk about, but you've got to know the codes. But if you don't know the codes, if you're not integrating the code requirements into your practices and your operations, you know, when that one moment in time occurs, when that wildfire is racing towards your facility, like it did devastating several healthcare facilities in California recently, 
when that internal fire occurs in your facility, causing smoke and heat and other perils within your facility, you've got to make sure that those systems that are in place, that the people that you've trained, and that all of those programmatic um, elements come together to help protect the lives of those people that are in your facilities. So starting out with the codes, it's important to know the appropriate additions of the life safety code and associated NFPA codes and standards that apply in your facilities. And as a mock surveyor, you know, I get invited into healthcare facilities all the time. Like I said, a, a lot of skilled nursing facilities around the country. I often see that um, the facilities may not be utilizing the uh, enforced code at the time of my visit. Um, they're very proud to show me the library of codes and standards that are on this bookshelf in the facilities managers or the maintenance director's office, but sometimes I have to disappoint them and say, listen, that's the wrong edition of the code. When it comes to CMS compliance and regulated healthcare facilities, we know that you are dealing with the 2012 edition of NFPA 101, the Life Safety Code, and the 2012 edition of NFPA 99, the Healthcare Facilities Code. Enforcement of these editions of the code started in November of 2016 with an effective date of July 5th of 2016. The previous edition of those codes was the 2000 edition of the Life Safety Code and the 1999 edition of NFPA 99, as enforced by CMS. So we're only focused on the CMS regulations right now. And again, you've got to understand that you've got multiple jurisdictions, mul multiple authorities having jurisdictions that you have to deal with. So it's important for you to know the codes. But specifically, when it comes to CMS requirements, we know that the additions of the um, codes that you need to require to ensure your licensure requirements are uh, illustrated right up there on the board. Now, of course, that's not all of the, the codes that you've got to deal with. But the highlighted codes include the sprinkler code, um, NFPA 25, inspection and testing of sprinkler and installed fire suppression systems, uh, NFPA 72 for fire alarms. You can see that there are additions of the codes that are, you know, at first glance, older than current times. And yes, there are newer additions of the codes that are being enforced by other authorities having jurisdiction, but when it comes to NFPA, CMS compliance, these are the additions of the codes that are currently being uh, enforced. For a complete listing of those codes and standards and other referenced publications, you simply need to go to Chapter 2 of NFPA 101, the Life Safety Code, and it'll show you exactly what additions of those codes and standards and if there's any exclusions within those codes and standards. You know, when uh, we made a switch from the 20 uh, to the 2012 edition of the Life Safety Code from the two, uh, 2000 edition as enforced by CMS, there were definitely some changes and some um, things that occurred that you need to know about. So what I want to do now is just kind of highlight some of those changes that occurred with Life Safety Code and FPA 101, 2012 edition, and compliance of those codes. One of the um, significant changes is a change in fire watch requirements. Previously, as most of you know, a fire watch was triggered within your healthcare facility whenever your fire sprinkler system or fire suppression system, we're talking about your fire sprinkler system, was down for four or more continuous hours in a 24 hour period. So let's say that you had a failure of a fire alarm system, or you had a sprinkler break, or you're having service done in your uh, on any of those systems. If those systems were down for four or more hours in a continuous 24-hour period, you were required to um, enact your fire watch policy. There's been a big change when it comes to the sprinkler system. No longer is it a four-hour threshold; it has now been changed to a 10-hour threshold. So if your fire suppression system is down for 10 hours or more in a 24-hour period, that is your trigger to initiate a fire watch. Now, I'm going to take off the, the regulator's hat for a second, and I'm going to go back to the firefighter. 
or the administrator or even the maintenance director's perspective. If your fire suppression system goes down at any time, you're not going to wait for 10 hours to initiate a fire watch. You're going to likely initiate that fire watch immediately because you know that your fire suppression system is compromised or even your fire alarm system. You would go into a fire watch immediately. The key element when it comes to compliance is that you don't need to go into a formal and documented fire watch until that suppression system is down for 10 hours or more. And within your policies and procedures for fire watch, you likely have some uh, obligation to notify the local authority having jurisdiction, meaning the fire department, to call your state regulatory body and let them know that your system is down. So make sure that in practice, whenever any fire suppression or fire alarm system is compromised, your team goes on high alert and you're going into a fire watch. But when it comes to the codes and regulations, you have to go into a fire watch when your fire alarm system is down for four hours or more in a 24-hour period, continuous, or your suppression system goes down for 10 hours or more. When it comes to other elements of operation, specifically in reference to infection control, you know, I walk into healthcare facilities all the time, and I see those alcohol-based hand rub uh, dispensers everywhere. Well, there is some allowance of a specific amount of those devices within individual smoke compartments. And here's what you need to know. Within a smoke compartment, within the means of egress, so that means the common areas that lead to an exit, generally we're talking about your hallways, you're limited to 10 gallons of solution, of that alcohol-based solution. But when it comes to the overall presence of ABHR in the smoke compartment, you do not need to include the devices. You're limited to one, but the ABHR devices that are in a patient or resident room. So those, uh, that volume in the resident or patient room is not considered part of that 10 gallon aggregate limit. So you need to make sure that you comply with the elements of spacing, that you don't have them near electrical components like light switches and uh, electrical outlets. And the codes are pretty prescriptive about that. But in general, you're allowed to have more of these devices, but they cannot exceed 10 gallons per smoke compartment in the common areas or the means of egress. I remember I made a site visit to a facility in northern Arizona, and it was clear they must have had some kind of issue because um, within that facility, they had, an, they had installed an ABHR on each side of the hallway about every 10 feet. Once we did a quick calculation, it was clear that they exceeded the volume just by the pure, uh, the pure presence of all those devices. So make sure you comply with the regulations. You know, the Life Safety Code and associated documents takes into account that all of your buildings in general, especially our nursing homes, are fully sprinklered in every nook and cranny. You know, there are some exceptions in hospitals and other types of healthcare facilities that are older where sprinklers are not yet installed everywhere. But in general, if you've got a fully sprinkler facility, you've got some relief when it comes to waste containers, specifically your clean uh, containers that would keep your recyclables. You now, outside of a protected area, which is like a storage room or a, a soil utility room, you're allowed to have a higher limit of volume of clean waste outside of a protected area. So that new limit is 96 gallons. But when it comes to soil, linen, or trash, that requirement remains unchanged. So outside of a protected area like a soil utility room or a protected storage room that is um, a one-hour rated construction with a self-closing rated door and fire sprinkler system, uh, you are only allowed to have 36-gallon limits outside of those protected areas. Speaking of corridors, when it comes to projections within the, um, the minimal eight foot wide corridor that's requ uh, required in a healthcare facility, NFPA says that you can now have a six inch projection or protrusion within that eight foot corridor. But we've got a conflict, actually a couple of conflicts. One conflict is uh, ADA. ADA says you can only project or protrude six inches into that minimal eight foot wide corridor. 
The other conflict, if you're lucky enough to be a healthcare provider in California, that limit is even less, meaning you've got to comply with OSHPOD requirements. Those of you in California know exactly what I'm talking about when I reference OSHPOD. That is another regulatory agency that regulates healthcare facilities, and I believe their limit in an eight-foot-wide corridor is an inch and a half. So you've got to know your codes, you've got to know your authorities having jurisdiction, and you've got to know what your projections can be. Now, if the corridor or hallway is wider than eight feet, especially significantly wider, this rule is kind of uh, in, uh, null and void because this is only applicable in eight-foot-wide corridors. When it comes to locking arrangements, there is some relief as well. Previously, under the 2000 edition of the Life Safety Code, you were only allowed to have a single uh, delayed egress locking device in any single means of egress and exit path, meaning you could not have more than one. But again, because of the acknowledgement of the enhancements to building construction and fire protection systems in healthcare facilities, the 2012 edition and newer editions of uh, the Life Safety Code allow you to have unlimited delayed egress within any single means of egress. When it comes to special locking arrangements, previously the code would only factor in the clinical needs of your patients or residents, allowing you to have uh, secure facilities with certain types of locking arrangements. The newer edition of the code, the 2012 edition of the code, allows you to have um, to factor in the safety needs of the residents. So it's kind of a broader interpretation. You really need to get into the NFPA 101 handbook and the code itself to look at those types of conditions that allowed for special locking arrangements. But in the context of our call today, I just want you to know that you've got a broader application of having a locked facility. When it comes to the vertical elements of the means of egress, uh, specifically our stairwell, there are some new requirements prescribed in the code for signage within the stairwell that um, clearly identifies the floor or landing or point of egress that you're on. So if you've got a facility that is three or more stories vertically in height, and that would even include if one of those stories goes below grade, like to a basement, you got to make sure that you prescribe with those elements of signage within your stairwells. One of the, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the newer requirements that's kind of been a heavy lift for providers in healthcare, particularly nursing homes and in hospitals, especially if you haven't been doing this all along, is a process known as a fire door assembly inspection. This is a new documented process that has got to be done annually. It needs to be documented, and it's got to be done by a qualified person. So you might think, what's the big deal? We look at our doors regularly. We might be doing a monthly, even maybe even a weekly check, but this is a comprehensive assessment of a door that looks at multiple elements. You know, you see on the screen right now some of those elements that are illustrated, but you gotta make sure that you're doing a comprehensive annual documented um, fire door assembly inspection of your fire doors in your facility. Here's some good news, especially for our folks in the skilled nursing facility world, um, where you've got you know limited budget, limited capabilities, limited staff. CMS has come out and said, you know what, your maintenance staff generally possesses the skills and knowledge needed to perform this function during the course of routine maintenance. NFPA 80, uh, NFPA 80 itself doesn't really prescribe any certifications or specific requirements, but other than saying that the person performing needs to be qualified and have good knowledge of how a door and all the associated elements, the hardware, the frame, all the other components uh, generally operate. So you've got to do this uh, on an annual basis, and you've got to make sure that you're documenting this process. When it comes to other items like corridor clutter, uh, NFPA 101 Life Safety Code allows for some new uh, conditions to be present within that means of egress. And again, when we talk about the minimal e means of egress, we're talking about those eight-foot corridors. 
in an eight-foot corridor, you are now allowed to have the presence of equipment, things like carts and other items that you need to operate your facility present uh, for an unlimited amount of time, providing that you are leaving a residual five-foot clear width within that minimal eight-foot means of egress. You know, this has been a big problem. You know, I work with um, facilities around the country, and every state seems to do a, a little bit differently. In some states, uh, if a surveyor is in your building and they see an item there on one side or the other for more than three minutes, they used to cite you for the presence of corridor clutter. If they would see things on both sides of the corridor, they're going to cite you because everything, as you know, needs to be to one side. But you are now allowed to have those items in that corridor for an unlimited amount of time, providing that they are not pieces of, of equipment that are in storage. So if you've got that med cart, that lift, that um, housekeeping cart that might be in use and present in that corridor for 10, 15, 20 minutes or longer, as long as it's being utilized and not in storage, it's allowed to be there. Again, keeping everything on one side and keeping or maintaining five feet of clear width. In that pursuit of a home-like environment in our facilities, particularly in our, in our skilled nursing facilities, we know that there's a, a strong desire to make that environment of care more home-like. So there are now allowances within the 2012 edition of the Life Safety Code where you're allowed to have some items of furniture in that eight foot wide means of egress. There's several caveats to it though. If there's gonna be a bench, for example, or even a chair, a couch, a table, if they're in that means of egress that's eight foot wide, that item needs to be affixed to that wall or floor. There can be groupings of furniture no greater than 60, fair, uh, excuse me, groupings of furniture no larger than 50 square feet, and they can't be any closer, those groupings of 50 square feet can't be any closer than 10 feet apart. Again, everything needs to be on one side of the hallway, and it cannot obstruct access to any critical areas within your building, a mechanical room, a storage room, or a door of any type. But when you use these kinds of items, let's say you want to put a bench in the center of your eight-foot corridor halfway down the hallway, you cannot reduce that eight-foot corridor any more than six feet. So that means that item that you're going to permanently affix to that uh, wall or floor in that corridor can't be any larger than two feet wide. Now, there's a lot of debate and controversy in some circles regarding this stuff, but the bottom line is those are the code requirements right there. Personally, in an eight-foot wide corridor, I don't like to see um, any kind of permanently affixed piece of furniture unless it's really minimal, but you're going to find out in an emergency you're going to need every element of that hallway to evacuate. So those kinds of obstructions, while allowed, um, they um, can be a hindrance. So keep all that in mind. When it comes to that home-like environment, there are new um, requirements that allow you to have cooking facilities with some limited use within your um, smoke compartments. You're allowed to have a single open-sourced cooking area within a smoke compartment that serves no more than 30 residents, providing that it's fully sprinklered and the cooking device, including a commercial, I'm sorry, a residential quality um, stovetop or range, um, can be within those areas, providing that they're only used for food preparation purposes. You're not going to be able to do any kind of heavy cooking or frying in that open kitchen that comes off the corridor within that smoke compartment that is fully protected with a sprinkler system, fire protection system, you know, smoke detectors, et cetera. But um, it can only serve uh, a population of, of 30 residents or more. Get into section 18 or 19 of NFPA 101. Of course, 18 is for existing healthcare facility, 19, correction, 18 is for new healthcare facilities, and chapter 19 is for existing healthcare facilities. The uh, information that you need to know about cooking facilities within a patient care, uh, patient care area are clearly defined in there. 
Same thing with fireplaces. There are some allowances for fireplaces to be within a patient care area, within a specific smoke compartment, providing that there are certain elements like smoke detectors, um, protection in front of the fireplace itself, uh, and the presence of carbon monoxide detectors and other things. When it comes to uh, combustible decorations, I probably should have put a chart up on this one, but there are definitely some relaxed requirements. As you all know, previously, everything needed to be non-combustible, everything needed to be treated, and it needed to be limited. But now, again, in pursuit of this home-like environment in our healthcare facilities, particularly our nursing homes, you're allowed to have in your means of egress, in that eight-foot minimum corridor, you can have up to 30% combustible decorations present as long as your building is fully sprinklered. And we know all of our nursing homes are fully sprinklered. Uh, not all of our hospitals are, so you've got to take that in consideration because there's a lesser requirement if it's unsprinklered. But let's just talk sprinklered for a second. In a means of egress, you can have combustible decorations that comply, uh, comprise up to 30% of the wall space. Now, I don't know about you, but if it's me and it's my facility, I'm still going to limit my combustible decorations, probably a lot less than 30%, but that is what the code prescribes. In a resident room, you know, especially in our long-term care facilities, we see that home-like environment evolving. You know, I see a lot of combustible material in resident rooms in nursing homes, and maybe that's sometimes present in hospitals and other healthcare facilities. But the bottom line is um, you're allowed to have up to 50% of that wall space to include combustible decorations. Now, again, I try to limit it as much as possible, but sometimes there are cultural uh, elements that you need to consider. Um, I do some work on certain Indian reservations around the country where I visit nursing homes, and you know there are wall hangings and decorative uh, items that go in a resident's room that pertain to their culture. The bottom line is make sure it's safe. And if you can, protect it and treat it to make it less combustible, uh, you can do it. But again, go into the life safety code and you're gonna see those uh, requirements clearly defined. A big change to the 2012 edition of the life safety code, uh, code and newer editions is a new chapter. <clears throat> and that's chapter 43. Chapter 43 deals with building rehabilitation, a lot of prescriptive information. So if you're gonna upgrade, you're gonna renovate, you're gonna modify, you're gonna do, um, some additions to your facilities, or if you're dealing with a historic facility, make sure that you're very familiar with Chapter 43 of the Life Safety Code. Let's uh, change gears a little bit and talk about NFPA 99, the Healthcare Facilities Code. Same adoption date as the Life Safety Code, same effective date, same enforcement date. You know, uh, when those were adopted back in 2016, uh, the delays in adoption to enforcement or to allow all authorities having jurisdiction as well as the providers themselves some extra time to get ready for the transition. Again, the previous edition of 99 was the 1999 edition. Uh, the big difference is uh, that there are even newer editions. And this is, again, just a, a caution to everybody out there. If you've got the new edition or a newer edition of 99 on your bookshelf, like the 2015 edition, you've got to understand that that, according to CMS regulations, is not the applicable edition that you need to be familiar with. You need to be familiar with the 2012 edition of NFPA 99. The big difference between uh, the 99 edition and the 2012 edition of NFPA 99 is that the 1999 edition was an occupancy-based standard. That means that it was a standard that applied to all healthcare facilities. I remember trying to fit the elements of 1999 into a nursing home, and it was somewhat difficult because most of the applicability of the 99 edition of 99 really didn't apply to a nursing home. There was no surgical suites. There were no suites in general. There were no radiology departments or other technical elements in the 2012 edition of NFPA 99. Everyone on the line today needs to know that the 2012 edition of NFPA 99 is a risk-based code. 
And because it's a risk-based code, it applies to healthcare facilities in accordance with the identified risk. And when it comes to identifying the risks, um, there's a process that we're going to talk about. But before we get there, if you're someone, especially in a hospital, someone that was an accredited facility, you need to understand that in those facilities, the um, code itself is completely reorganized. If you took the 99 edition and you um, weighted against the 2012 edition, you're going to see that everything has been reorganized in a completely different manner. Here's one thing I want to shout out to. I've already referenced the Life Safety Code Handbook um, for the administrators on the call or those regional people. If you're struggling uh, on what to get your facilities management people for the next holiday season, a perfect gift would be the NFPA 101 and NFPA 99 handbooks. These are resources that provide a complete listing of the code requirements themselves, but also gives you a ton of resource and explanatory material that helps you get better clarity on the code. And particularly when it comes to NFPA 99, you want to have that handbook. Equally, you want the handbook for NFPA 101, but it's about as thick uh, as a, uh, as a hard cover printed edition of an older version of a Bible. But these are the Bibles when it comes to code enforcement of 101 and 99. So think about getting the handbook so that you can get all the resource and explanatory information uh, in play. When it comes to the risk assessment process, so you can apply NFPA 99, you've got to establish a risk assessment team so that you can assess the risks that are associated with your healthcare facilities operation so you can determine which elements of NFPA 99 applies. Now, CMS nor NFPA tells you exactly. It doesn't prescribe to you the risk assessment process or who should be on that risk assessment team. And you definitely want a team approach so that you get multiple perspectives when assessing the risk, which we're going to talk about in a second here. But there are some suggested um, things that you do follow some suggested ways of putting that risk assessment team together, and some suggested processes on how to conduct a risk assessment. But especially to our friends from the nursing homes and other less sophisticated elements of healthcare, you know, below the hospital level, um, there are some processes that you can look at and they're illustrated there on the screen, or you can put together a simple risk assessment process that looks at the risk of failure. And that's really what this is all about. You are going to assess the system and the equipment that is present in your healthcare facility. And you're gonna determine what the consequences of failure is going to be. And when we talk about failure, we're talking about the worst possible outcome. We're talking about catastrophic uh, failure of a system. Let's talk about your electrical system. We're talking about failure of your municipal electrical feed that's coming into your, electri uh, your healthcare facility, as well as failure of any redundancies or backups. So we're talking about your emergency generator. You've got to assess the risk of catastrophic failure without any human intervention of a system within your facility. So that's how you assess the risk. And when you're looking at that catastrophic failure, you're going to categorize that risk into four specific categories. Category one, catastrophic failure of a system like your electrical system or your HVAC system or a plumbing system. Failure of that system may cause death or serious injury to a patient, resident, staff member within the facility. Category two, failure of a system may cause minor injury. Category three, Failure of your systems or equipment may cause discomfort. Or category four, failure of a system will have no consequence at all. Now, there are some very prescriptive, um, very prescriptive information within the code and within the handbook <clears throat> that describes what we mean by serious injury or minor injury. Everybody knows what death means or what discomfort means. So you need to get into the code book, then you need to get in the handbook, 
and look at all of the information in there describing what those different categories really mean. Once you determine what your risks are after completing an NFPA 99 risk assessment tool, you then are able to determine what elements of the code apply. You need to do a risk assessment whenever you're doing any renovation, remodeling, new construction, or change of use of any area or space in your healthcare facility. So for example, if you're gonna take an office and translate it from an office space into a patient care area, like an exam room, you need to look at that space and you need to perform a risk assessment on all of the systems and any equipment that will be within that space and determine if those new elements that will be in that space are gonna qualify as the category one, two, three, or four. And then once you make that determination, let's say that you're gonna take that office space, turn it into a patient care space, and your team has conducted a risk assessment process and determined that failure of the electricity or the electrical delivery system in that newly remodeled space that's now gonna be a patient care area is gonna qualify as a category two uh, requirement. Once you look at NFTA 99 to determine how you're gonna remodel that space and what your code parameters are, you would have to follow all category two requirements for that space when it comes to the electrical system. Let's say for whatever reason you said failure of a plumbing system within that space would be a category one risk. That would mean that in the plumbing section of NFTA 99, you would have to follow all category one guidance for that space. I know, it's as clear as mud, but once you get into the handbook, you'll be able to see exactly how to apply this risk assessment process. You know, when it comes to progress, when it comes to history, and being a former deputy fire chief, a firefighter, a fire marshal, I sure had my um, experience in responding to fires in healthcare facilities. In my jurisdiction, I had a large community hospital, four skilled nursing facilities, several assisted living facilities, a continuing care retirement community, where the whole continuum of elder healthcare was present on a single campus. I responded to some pretty significant events. And historically, we know that there have been significant fires in healthcare facilities. Um, you know, through the last century or so. But with the presence of fire sprinkler systems, with the presence of enhanced uh, construction techniques and technology, we know that we're limiting even more than the chart that I have on the, on the screen right now. We're seeing a substantial increase, excuse me, a, a substantial decrease of injury and deaths in healthcare facilities. And regardless of what type of healthcare facility you are, <clears throat> It's important to know that the mission is the same in any kind of healthcare facility. We wanna make sure that you are providing a safe and compliant environment of care, not just for compliance purposes, but when that one moment in time where that fire occurs or an incident happens, those systems are gonna work. We know that you deal with a lot of code issues, different codes, different editions, multiple jurisdictions, a plethora of different surveyors, different inspectors. I know I'm gonna make you chuckle right here. You never receive any conflicting information from your authorities having jurisdiction, right? Of course you do. You get different impressions, different guidance, different regulations from all the different authority having jurisdictions that you have to deal with. You know, whether it's the regulators, the responders, you know, I know. Sometimes those responders get into your facility and they've got a perspective on, on code enforcement practices. Why is everything on one side of the hall? Maybe it should be moved over here. Shouldn't you have an exit sign down this hall or so forth? The architects, the engineers, the vendors, even the consultants, and then combine that with ownership and, manage, and management and leadership, you get all of the different code interpretations we know that it leads to one thing, and that one thing is a lot of frustration. You know, as a mock surveyor, and even my time as the fire marshal in my community, I would see common 
findings all the time. And to this day, I still see uh, evidence of poor documentation when it comes to inspection, maintenance, and testing uh, of your fire suppression systems, your life safety systems. That documentation is not always in pristine condition. A big problem is the documentation when it comes to your fire drills. Sometimes I'll see a half-ripped legal page uh, stuck in a compliance binder with everybody's name scribbled on there, and that's their evidence of a fire drill. It's not going to stand up to the test of the surveyors. It is certainly not going to be an asset to you in a deposition or in a courtroom. Make sure that your documentation is clean and crisp and concise so that it's well organized and it's easy to understand. When it comes to training, whether it's fire extinguisher, pass, race, evacuation, horizontal, vertical, complete evacuation, you know, I still see a lot of training that just involves uh, turning on a video, going into an online resource, and having your folks sit in front of a screen to learn how to respond to emergencies. You've got to make sure that you are providing practical training, that you are doing <clears throat> drills and exercises in accordance with the new CMS EP requirements of participation. When it comes to physical hazards and the unsafe practices, same old, same old, same old. I see the same things, and we're going to go real quickly through a bunch of the same things that I see. <clears throat> but when it comes to the general <clears throat> elements of life safety compliance in healthcare facilities, I bet you're going to agree with this. There's a certain level of complacency that we see, a lack of safety and preparedness culture that can equate to disaster. You need to, uh, to um, focus on success. So we've got to get rid of these common findings that we continuously see. The door wedges or the doors that are improperly held open, they've got to go. You're only allowed to open or prop open a door when you're allowed to do it with an automatic closure or if you do it in a compliant manner with a single action, a push or a pull. And the code outlines some ways to compliantly keep a door held open. A common thing, especially in a lot of the older facilities I see, especially in California, where the age of a nursing home, for example, is pretty darn old. I think it's around 50 years. Uh, a lot of uh, doors to the bedroom, to the resident room, that are blocked by the beds themselves. You know, you never understand, unless you're a firefighter, or you've had an experience, how important a closed door is until you need a door to be closed, to resist smoke, to keep a fire confined. Make sure all those items that are in the swing path to resident doors, to patient doors, or even to the cross corridor or smoke and fire doors, there is, should be nothing within the swing paths of those doors to make sure that they close and a positive latch occurs where a positive latch is required to safeguard the spaces within your healthcare facilities. When it comes to safeguarding those spaces, even the smallest penetrations can be enough to transmit smoke, heat, and products of uh, uh, combustion within your healthcare facility. If that's a one hour rated um, ceiling, it is now completely compromised by the gap that's around that electrical piping right there. You've got to make sure that those gaps are sealed with proper fire stopping, caulking, or taping methods. When it comes to your fire sprinkler heads, particularly the heads themselves, we see a lot of painted and compromised heads in your facilities. They have to be free and clear of all foreign material, and that is corrosion and rust and other things like dust and debris and spider webs. Otherwise, you're going to get the tag from the surveyors. You've got to have that magic level of, of clearance beneath and around your, uh, your sprinkler heads. If I were to ask the group right now to tell me what that magic number is, I know, of course, you would all say 18 inches of vertical clearance below those sprinkler heads. Make sure that they're not obstructed when it comes to medical gaskets. How many times have you seen this? How many times have I seen this as a regulator, as a fire marshal, or more commonly lately as a mock surveyor, whether it's in a resident room, an equipment area, uh, a nurse's station, a medical room, um, a med room. You can't have these freestanding uh, oxygen cylinders or other gaseous pressurized 
cylinders within your facility. They've got to be properly secured. But you know what? I see it all the time. When it comes to the electrical hazards in your facility, how many times do I pop a ceiling tile? I look behind a uh, an opening and I see uh, a 1900 box or a junction box that's missing its co cover. And you might say, but it's low voltage. If a cover should be on it, a cover should be there. And when it comes to the expansion of your electrical delivery system, we all know that extension cords can't be used unless used for a temporary purpose, like for a single uh, uh, a defined action, like you need the extension cord while you're using um, a floor buffer. You can use it while you're using it for that specific task, but we can't see them in place like we see them all the time as a replacement for permanent wiring. Do a safety tour of your facility. Go on the hunt for those extension cords and get them out of your facility. When it comes to access to things like fire extinguishers, we see them compromised or blocked all the time. What's the magic number there? Everyone, not 18 inches, it's 36 inches of clear width around those extinguishers, around your pull stations, within the means of egress. We've already talked about reducing um, the means of egress. This is clearly storage. It can't be only um, two feet or three feet on one side. It can't be there at all. Make sure that your corridors are not being used for storage because the mock surveyor, like me, is going to call you out on it and the surveyor or the inspector is going to give you the citation, the ticket, or the tag for it. You know, when it boils right down to it, it is about compliance. We want to make sure that survey and inspection are done successfully. We know that there are certain survey success models that are out there that include a good compliance binder that has all of your documentation cleanly um, uh, segregated between your sprinkler system, your emergency generator, your fire alarm system. All of your evidence of compliance needs to be in those compliance books. Your team, not only your facilities management staff, but even line staff through all levels of your organization need to know Life Safety 101. They need to know that everything needs to be to one side or the other. They need to be trained on keeping those storage closets, those linen rooms, to a storage height that's 18 inches below the bottom of those sprinkler heads. They need to know race and path like the back of their hand. Because regardless of the authority having jurisdiction that you're dealing with, whether it's the good looking fire inspector from your local jurisdiction, whether it's that county health inspector, the state inspector or a federal surveyor, or your accreditation team, you've got to be prepared for survey because it is about compliance. We've got to be ready for anything. So Catherine, any calls, uh, any questions, uh, how can we um, show this presentation up today with a little bit of interaction with our audience? Thank you, Stan. Um, uh, yes, I do have a few questions. Um, the first one is, why is the fire door assembly inspection process so important? Um, why is this such an important part of the life safety code compliance? Well, one of the reasons it's important is um, the surveyors have been newly trained on this process. So it's kind of at the forefront of their minds. It's a new requirement. So they're gonna make sure that it is being um, complied with and they're gonna be ensured to enforce it. Now, I didn't take the time today to show you all the pictures that I like to show when I do a live workshop. But again, the going back to my roots as a firefighter or anybody that's had an experience with a fire, a fire we know that a closed door is the difference between life or death. And there are certain um, tolerances within that door that sits within a door frame that are allowable. For example, you're only allowed to have an eighth of an inch gap around the um, three parts of the door that um, sit into that frame. Those are the sides and the top. And in general, the undercut of that door can be no more than three quarter of an inch. Uh, someone that's performing the FDAI process will assess those elements of requirement. And many times we see gaps that are greater than an eighth of an inch. We see undercut cuts that are greater than a, a three quarters of an inch. And if those types of um, conditions are present, 
and there's a fire on that door one side or the other, that smoke or that heat is going to transmit through that door. So the FDAI process is so important so that you are maintaining one of the most important, critical, and passive elements of life safety in your healthcare facilities, and that is the doors and the frames. So the FDAI process requires or compels operators to assess those doors on an annual documented basis, not only to ensure compliance, but to ensure the door is going to be the protective or the barrier that it was designed to be. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, we have another question here. Are there any sure. sections of NFPA 99, the Healthcare Facilities Code, that are not being enforced by CMS? Yes, there are some sections of uh, 99 that have been excluded from enforcement because there are other codes and standards and regulations that relate to the operations within a healthcare facility. Specifically, the sections that relate to fire protection systems, security, and emergency preparedness in NFPA 99 are excluded from CF CMS enforcement because they've adopted other NFPA um, codes and standards to enforce those elements of regulation, as well as the new emergency preparedness rules of participation, which are much more comprehensive that deal with emergency preparedness. So the parts of 99 that don't apply are security, fire protection systems, and emergency preparedness. If you go into the table of contents, you'll see what sections those specifically are. Okay, and then uh, we have a question about strategies. Um, can you talk about some strategies for life safety code survey success? Yeah, I started to talk about that on the wrap up. You know, it's about being good clerically. There's nothing more that that frustrates a mock surveyor um, or a surveyor, an inspector, someone that's regulating you or trying to assess you for accreditation than being in a maintenance director's or a facility management office and going through reams of disorganized or unorganized paperwork, seeing that the person responsible for the maintenance of that documentation doesn't have a good handle on where everything should be. So a lot of it focuses on documentation. Making sure that documentation is in a well-marked binder. Making sure that that binder is tabbed into the sections, like I said before, fire alarm, kitchen fire protection, hood cleaning, emergency generator, suppression system, fire drills, evacuation drills, um, et cetera, et cetera. Making sure that that stuff is all easily accessible, clearly identified, so that you can almost de-escalate the anxiety of the surveyor. When you can lay everything out on a table and say, here it is, what are you, look, what are you looking for, and I'm going to show you, that is really a good strategy. Um, getting better training in place for the survey process. Uh, you know, you've got to be prepared for the survey or the inspection process. Understanding what they're looking for, um, dealing with someone that has had some past experience, or even getting into kind of a mentorship mode. Partnering with another facility or someone within your organization that's had that survey uh, experience. You know, you want to give the surveyor or the inspector or the person that's assessing you uh, the information that they ask for. Don't be too quick to show them things that they haven't necessarily asked for. You kind of let them lead the dance, but you are always prepared to uh, properly address the things that they're asking for. You know, speaking of mentorship, this is more relatable to emergency preparedness, but in my capacity as a consultant, I work for the healthcare associations in Arizona and California as a consultant. And recently, I just partnered two facilities together. Now, some on the call might say, wait a second, you're taking competitors and you're having them work together. But well, it was in reference to emergency preparedness. I had a very well-seasoned, well-qualified environmental services director at one facility down the street from another facility who really knew emergency preparedness requirements. 
and she put together an emergency preparedness binder, a compliance binder, similar to your life safety and NFPA 99 binders, and she did an exceptional job. She got a deficiency-free survey. At the other facility down the street, a competitor, we had a brand new person that was put in place who was really hungry for some experience and some guidance. And I asked the experienced person to kind of mentor the inexperienced person and it equated to success. That experienced person was able to guide the inexperienced person who ultimately had a deficiency-free emergency preparedness survey under the life safety survey that she had within the facility. So partnership, mentorship, knowing the codes, taking advantage of all of the great resources that you guys, Catherine, provide, the free webinars, the resources that you have online, uh, embrace the resources that you get from your state healthcare associations. When they've got a guy like me who will be in Kansas in July doing a, 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 serve, a presentation, um, you know, send your people to those conferences. Spend the few dollars that you might have to um, spend to get your people better educated on life safety code compliance, emergency preparedness compliance, and um, the survey process. Wonderful. That's really, really wonderful advice. So um, do you have any other um, words of advice for us or anything you'd like to leave with us as we as we wrap up? You know, I say this in all my live workshops that I do, especially when I'm in that room that's typically filled with more testosterone than we see at a lot of healthcare conferences. I'm talking about a lot of the maintenance facilities people. Generally, a lot of guys are in the room. And the one thing that I always say to the audience, the guys, the girls alike, when it comes to life safety code compliance, it is not rocket science. There are certainly other elements of healthcare facility operation that are high tech, extremely sophisticated. But when it comes to life safety code compliance, it is a lot of common sense. If it looks unsafe, it's generally unsafe. When that resident or patient comes in with extension cords, power strips, decoration, sometimes we'll even see live candles, open flames in a healthcare oh facility. You need to know the codes. You need to know how to enforce the codes. You need to always advocate on the safety of the occupants in that facility. If it's unsafe, if it looks unsafe, if your gut is telling you it's unsafe, it probably is. You know, embrace the resources. Use um, the consultants. You know, don't be quick to go to your authority having jurisdiction unless you've really got a focus an objective question that's got some pretty clear parameters. While they are very happy to assist you, you know, one thing that is clear, sometimes you open up a can of worms when you invite someone in if you're not prepared to deal with the question. So embrace your resources, your consultants, your associations, better educate your whole team because in an emergency, it's not just your facilities people that's responding, it's your care staff, it's your administrative staff, it's everybody in a healthcare facility that needs to work synergistically to make sure that the damage, the business disruption, and most importantly, any harm that could be caused to the occupants in our facilities, specifically our residents and our, and our patients, is limited, if not eliminated. Wonderful. Great. Well, um, thank you so much, and thank you so much for presenting this webinar for us. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you. It thank is you, my pleasure. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Well, um, audience, thank you as well. And uh, please use the contact information on the screen for any questions to contact Stan um, directly. And if you send us any questions afterwards, if you if you think of them, we'll forward them on. Um, please remember that your PACOM and your PMI CEU certificate will be emailed to you directly from within two days following the broadcast. There's no need to request it. You'll get it automatically. You can register for any future webinars or request a demo of our compliance solution on our website at firsthcc.com. You can also call us at 888-543-4778. And thank you for joining us.